The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Three, Chapter Thirteen How had it happened? Who had killed the convicts? Was it Ayrton? No, for a moment before he was dreading their return. But Ayrton was now in a profound stupor, from which it was no longer possible to rouse him. After uttering those few words he had again become unconscious, and had fallen back motionless on the bed. The colonists, a prey to a thousand confused thoughts, under the influence of violent excitement, waited all night without leaving Ayrton's house, or returning to the spot where lay the bodies of the convicts. It was very probable that Ayrton would not be able to throw any light on the circumstances under which the bodies had been found, since he himself was not aware that he was in the corral. But at any rate, he would be in a position to give an account of what had taken place before this terrible execution. The next day Ayrton awoke from his torpor, and his companions cordially manifested all the joy they felt on seeing him again, almost safe and sound, after a hundred and four days' separation. Ayrton then in a few words recounted what had happened, or at least as much as he knew. The day after his arrival at the corral, on the 10th of last November, at nightfall, he was surprised by the convicts, who had scaled the palisade. They bound and gagged him. Then he was led to a dark cavern at the foot of Mount Franklin, where the convicts had taken refuge. His death had been decided upon, and the next day the convicts were about to kill him, when one of them recognized him and called him by the name which he bore in Australia. The wretches had no scruples as to murdering Ayrton. They spared Ben Joyce. But from that moment Ayrton was exposed to the importunities of his former accomplices. They wished him to join them again, and relied upon his aid to enable them to gain possession of Granite House, to penetrate into that hitherto inaccessible dwelling, and to become masters of the island after murdering the colonists. Ayrton remained firm. The once convict, now repentant and pardoned, would rather die than betray his companions. Ayrton, bound, gagged, and closely watched, lived in this cave for four months. Nevertheless, the convicts had discovered the corral a short time after their arrival in the island, and since then they had subsisted on Ayrton's stores, but did not live at the corral. On the 11th of November, two of the villains, surprised by the colonists' arrival, fired at Herbert, and one of them returned, boasting of having killed one of the inhabitants of the island, but he returned alone. His companion, as is known, fell by Cyrus Harding's dagger. Ayrton's anxiety and despair may be imagined when he learned the news of Herbert's death. The settlers were now only four, and, as it seemed, at the mercy of the convicts. After this event, and during all the time that the colonists, detained by Herbert's illness, remained in the corral, the pirates did not leave their cavern and even after they had pillaged the plateau of Prospect Heights, they did not think it prudent to abandon it. The ill-treatment inflicted on Ayrton was now redoubled. His hands and feet still bore the bloody marks of the cords which bound him day and night. Every moment he expected to be put to death, nor did it appear possible that he could escape. Matters remained thus until the third week of February. The convicts, still watching for a favorable opportunity, rarely quitted their retreat, and only made a few hunting excursions, either to the interior of the island or the south coast. Ayrton had no further news of his friends, and relinquished all hope of ever seeing them again. At last, the unfortunate man, weakened by ill-treatment, fell into a prostration so profound that sight and hearing failed him. From that moment, that is to say, since the last two days, he could give no information whatever of what had occurred. But, Captain Harding, he added, since I was imprisoned in that cavern, how is it that I find myself in the corral? How is it that the convicts are lying yonder dead in the middle of the enclosure? answered the engineer. Dead! cried Ayrton. 
half rising from his bed, notwithstanding his weakness. His companions supported him. He wished to get up, and with their assistance he did so. They then proceeded together towards the little stream. It was now broad daylight. There, on the bank, in the position in which they had been stricken by death in its most instantaneous form, lay the corpses of the five convicts. Ayrton was astounded. Harding and his companions looked at him without uttering a word. On a sign from the engineer, Neb and Pencroft examined the bodies, already stiffened by the cold. They bore no apparent trace of any wound. Only, after carefully examining them, Pencroft found on the forehead of one, on the chest of another, on the back of this one, on the shoulder of that, a little red spot, a sort of scarcely visible bruise, the cause of which it was impossible to conjecture. "'It is there that they have been struck,' said Cyrus Harding. "'But with what weapon?' cried the reporter. "'A weapon lightning-like in its effects, and of which we have not the secret.' "'And who has struck the blow?' asked Pencroft. "'The avenging power of the island,' replied Harding. "'He who brought you here, Ayrton, whose influence has once more manifested itself, who does for us all that which we cannot do for ourselves, and who, his will accomplished, conceals himself from us.' "'Let us make search for him, then,' exclaimed Pencroft. "'Yes, we will search for him.' answered Harding, but we shall not discover this powerful being who performs such wonders until he pleases to call us to him. This invisible protection, which rendered their own action unavailing, both irritated and piqued the engineer. The relative inferiority which it proved was of a nature to wound a haughty spirit. A generosity evinced in such a manner as to elude all tokens of gratitude, implied a sort of disdain on those on whom the obligation was conferred, which in Cyrus Harding's eyes marred, in some degree, the worth of the benefit. "'Let us search,' he resumed, "'and God grant that we may some day be permitted to prove to this haughty protector that he has not to deal with ungrateful people. What would I not give could we repay him?' by rendering him in our turn, although at the price of our lives, some signal service. From this day the thoughts of the inhabitants of Lincoln Island were solely occupied with the intended search. Everything incited them to discover the answer to this enigma, an answer which would only be the name of a man endowed with a truly inexplicable and in some degree superhuman power. In a few minutes, the settlers re-entered the house, where their influence soon restored to Ayrton his moral and physical energy. Neb and Pencroft carried the corpses of the convicts into the forest, some distance from the corral, and buried them deep in the ground. Ayrton was then made acquainted with the facts which had occurred during his seclusion. He learned Herbert's adventures, and through what various trials the colonists had passed. As to the settlers, they had despaired of ever seeing Ayrton again, and had been convinced that the convicts had ruthlessly murdered him. And now, said Cyrus Harding, as he ended his recital, a duty remains for us to perform. Half of our task is accomplished, but although the convicts are no longer to be feared, it is not owing to ourselves that we are once more masters of the island. Well, answered Gideon Spilett, let us search all this labyrinth of the spurs of Mount Franklin. We will not leave a hollow, not a hole unexplored. Ah, if ever a reporter found himself face to face with a mystery, it is I who now speak to you, my friends. And we will not return to Granite House until we have found our benefactor, said Herbert. Yes, said the engineer, we will do all that is humanly possible to do. But I repeat, we shall not find him until he himself permits us. Shall we stay at the corral? asked Pencroft. We shall stay here, answered Harding. Provisions are abundant, and we are here in the very centre of the circle we have to explore. 
Besides, if necessary, the cart will take us rapidly to Granite House. Good, answered the sailor. Only I have a remark to make. What is it? Here is the fine season getting on, and we must not forget that we have a voyage to make. A voyage? asked Gideon Spilett. Yes, to Tabor Island, answered Pencroft. It is necessary to carry a notice there to point out the position of our island, and say that Ayrton is here in case the Scotch yacht should come to take him off. Who knows if it is not already too late? But, Pencroft, asked Ayrton, how do you intend to make this voyage? In the Bonaventure? The Bonaventure, exclaimed Ayrton. She no longer exists. My Bonaventure exists no longer, shouted Pencroft, bounding from his seat. No, answered Ayrton. The convicts discovered her in her little harbor only eight days ago. They put the sea in her and— And, said Pencroft, his heart beating, and not having Bob Harvey to steer her, they ran on the rocks, and the vessel went to pieces. "'Oh, the villains, the cutthroats, the infamous scoundrels!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'Pencroft,' said Herbert, taking the sailor's hand, "'we will build another Bonaventure, a larger one. We have all the ironwork, all the rigging of the brig at our disposal.' "'But do you know,' returned Pencroft, "'that it will take at least five or six months to build a vessel of from thirty to forty tons?' "'We can take our time.' said the reporter, and we must give up the voyage to Tabor Island for this year. Oh, my Bonaventure, my poor Bonaventure, cried Pencroft, almost broken-hearted at the destruction of the vessel, of which he was so proud. The loss of the Bonaventure was certainly a thing to be lamented by the colonists, and it was agreed that this loss should be repaired as soon as possible. This settled they now occupied themselves with bringing their researches to bear on the most secret parts of the island. The exploration was commenced at daybreak on the 19th of February, and lasted an entire week. The base of the mountain, with its spurs and their numberless ramifications, formed a labyrinth of valleys and elevations. It was evident that there, in the depths of these narrow gorges, perhaps even in the interior of Mount Franklin itself, was the proper place to pursue their researches. No part of the island could have been more suitable to conceal a dwelling whose occupant wished to remain unknown. But so irregular was the formation of the valleys, that Cyrus Harding was obliged to conduct the exploration in a strictly methodical manner. The colonists first visited the valley opening to the south of the volcano, and, which first received the waters of Falls River. There Ayrton showed them the cavern, where the convicts had taken refuge, and in which he had been imprisoned until his removal to the corral. This cavern was just as Ayrton had left it. They found there a considerable quantity of ammunition and provisions, conveyed thither by the convicts in order to form a reserve. The whole of the valley bordering on the cave, shaded by fir and other trees, was thoroughly explored, and on turning the point of the southwestern spur, the colonists entered a narrower gorge similar to the picturesque columns of basalt on the coast. Here the trees were fewer. Stones took the place of grass. Goats and musmons gambled among the rocks. Here began the barren part of the island. It could already be seen that, of the numerous valleys branching off at the base of Mount Franklin, Three only were wooded and rich in pasturage like that of the corral, which bordered on the west on the Falls River Valley, and on the east on the Red Creek Valley. These two streams, which lower down became rivers by the absorption of several tributaries, were formed by all the springs of the mountain and thus caused the fertility of its southern part. As to the Mercy, it was more directly fed from ample springs concealed under the cover of Jacamar Wood, and it was by springs of this nature, spreading in a thousand streamlets, that the soil of the Serpentine Peninsula was watered. Now of these three well-watered valleys, 
either might have served as a retreat to some solitary who would have found there everything necessary for life. But the settlers had already explored them, and in no part had they discovered the presence of man. Was it then in the depths of those barren gorges, in the midst of the piles of rock, in the rugged northern ravines, among the streams of lava, that this dwelling and its occupant were be found? The northern part of Mount Franklin was at its base composed solely of two valleys, wide, not very deep, without any appearance of vegetation, strewn with masses of rock, paved with lava, and varied with great blocks of mineral. This region required a long and careful exploration. It contained a thousand cavities, comfortless no doubt, but perfectly concealed and difficult of access. The colonists even visited dark tunnels, dating from the volcanic period, still black with the passage of the fire, and penetrated into the depths of the mountain. They traversed these somber galleries, waving lighted torches, they examined the smallest excavations, they sounded the shallowest depths, but all was dark and silent. It did not appear that the foot of man had ever before trodden these ancient passages, or that his arm had ever displaced one of these blocks, which remained as the volcano had cast them up above the waters at the time of the submersion of the island. However, although these passages appeared to be absolutely deserted, and the obscurity was complete, Cyrus Harding was obliged to confess that absolute silence did not reign there. On arriving at the end of one of these gloomy caverns, extending several hundred feet into the interior of the mountain, he was surprised to hear a deep rumbling noise, increased in intensity by the sonorousness of the rocks. Gideon Spilett, who accompanied him, also heard these distant mutterings, which indicated a revivification of the subterranean fires. Several times both listened, and they agreed that some chemical process was taking place in the bowels of the earth. "'Then the volcano is not totally extinct?' said the reporter. "'It is possible that since our exploration of the crater,' replied Cyrus Harding, some change has occurred. Any volcano, although considered extinct, may evidently again burst forth. But if an eruption of Mount Franklin occurred, asked Spilett, would there not be some danger to Lincoln Island? I do not think so, answered the engineer. The crater, that is to say the safety valve, exists and the overflow of smoke and lava would escape, as it did formerly, by this customary outlet. Unless the lava opened a new way for itself towards the fertile parts of the island. And why, my dear Spilett, answered Cyrus Harding, should it not follow the road naturally traced out for it? Well, volcanoes are capricious, returned the reporter. Notice, answered the engineer, that the inclination of Mount Franklin favors the flow of water towards the valleys which we are exploring just now. To turn aside this flow, an earthquake would be necessary to change the mountain's center of gravity. But an earthquake is always to be feared at these times, observed Gideon Spilett. Always, replied the engineer, especially when the subterranean forces begin to awake as they risk meeting with some obstruction after a long rest. Thus, my dear Spilett, an eruption would be a serious thing for us, and it would be better that the volcano should not have the slightest desire to wake up. But we could not prevent it, could we? At any rate, even if it should occur, I do not think Prospect Heights would be seriously threatened. Between them and the mountain, the ground is considerably depressed, and if the lava should ever take a course towards the lake, it would be cast on the downs and the neighboring parts of Shark Gulf. We have not yet seen any smoke at the top of the mountain to indicate an approaching eruption, said Gideon Spilett. No, answered Harding. Not a vapor escapes from the crater, for it was only yesterday that I attentively surveyed the summit. But it is probable that at the lower part of the chimney, 
time may have accumulated rocks, cinders, hardened lava, and that this valve of which I spoke may at any time become overcharged. But at the first serious effort, every obstacle will disappear, and you may be certain, my dear Spilett, that neither the island, which is the boiler, nor the volcano, which is the chimney, will burst under the pressure of gas. Nevertheless, I repeat, it would be better that there should not be an eruption. And yet we are not mistaken, remarked the reporter. Mutterings can be distinctly heard in the very bowels of the volcano. You are right, said the engineer, again listening attentively. There can be no doubt of it. A commotion is going on there, of which we can neither estimate the importance nor the ultimate result. Cyrus Harding and Spilett, on coming out, rejoined their companions, to whom they made known the state of affairs. Very well, cried Pencroft. The volcano wants to play his pranks. Let him try, if he likes. We will find his master. Who? asked Neb. Our good genius, Neb, our good genius, who will shut his mouth for him, if he so much as pretends to open it. As may be seen, the sailor's confidence in the tutelary deity of his island was absolute, and certainly the occult power, manifested until now in so many inexplicable ways, appeared to be unlimited, but also it knew how to escape the colonists' most minute researches, for in spite of all their efforts, in spite of the more than zeal, the obstinacy with which they carried on their exploration, the retreat of the mysterious being could not be discovered. From the 19th to the 25th of February, the circle of investigation was extended to all the northern region of Lincoln Island, whose most secret nooks were explored. The colonists even went the length of tapping every rock. The search was extended to the extreme verge of the mountain. It was explored thus to the very summit of the truncated cone terminating the first row of rocks, then to the upper ridge of the enormous hat, at the bottom of which opened the crater. They did more. They visited the gulf, now extinct, but in whose depths the rumbling could be distinctly heard. However, no sign of smoke or vapor, no heating of the rock, indicated an approaching eruption. But neither there nor in any other part of Mount Franklin did the colonists find any traces of him of whom they were in search. Their investigations were then directed to the downs. They carefully examined the high lava cliffs of Shark Gulf from the base to the crest, although it was extremely difficult to reach even the level of the gulf. No one. Nothing. Indeed, in these three words was summed up so much fatigue uselessly expended, so much energy producing no results, that somewhat of anger mingled with the discomfiture of Cyrus Harding and his companions. It was now time to think of returning, for these researches could not be prolonged indefinitely. The colonists were certainly right in believing that the mysterious being did not reside on the surface of the island, and the wildest fancies haunted their excited imaginations. Pancroft and Neb, particularly, were not contented with the mystery, but allowed their imaginations to wander into the domain of the supernatural. On the 25th of February, the colonists re-entered Granite House, and by means of the double cord, carried by an arrow to the threshold of the door, they re-established communication between their habitation and the ground. A month later they commemorated, on the 25th of March, the third anniversary of their arrival on Lincoln Island. End of chapter.